All right, so to the end of our atomic structure unit, um, today gets to be a mix of old and new because the trends I know you'll recognize, uh, but I need to give you an AP perspective on how to look at them so you can answer questions properly on AP. Um, but before we get into trends, I wanna show something I could have showed when I taught electron configuration, but we didn't have time. Um, those of y'all at home, you'll need your slides out so you can see what I'm pointing at. Um, a photoelectronic spect spectroscopy has the ability to give us a, a, a computerized reading that will connect or tell us the electron configuration of different elements. You will at some point be asked to read one of these, so you need to know what's going on on the different parts. I want you to notice that we've got energy along the bottom and number of electrons all right, along the uh, going vertically. So we'll have a specific element that it pinpoints on a, on a PES. In this case, it's beryllium. One of the things I want you to know right away about this graph is that the very, very bottom corner right here, that's the nucleus. So every time we go this direction and we have a spike that's telling us number of electrons, whichever spike is closest to the start of the graph is going to represent, represent electrons that are closest to the nucleus. So that's a good starting point for your brain. You'll notice that with the number of electrons being counted the way that they are, it's very easy to connect what element you're looking at with the grand total of electrons that are found. There's two electrons in the first spike, there's two electrons in the second spike, that's a grand total of four electrons, so it must be beryllium. Um, but the peaks themselves, the spikes, are representing different sublevels, all right? And we know that the sublevels are represented with letters. Um, so that first spike is not only two electrons, it's, it's one S2, all right? It's that first S. And then that other spike would be a different sublevel. Well, it's a different energy of S, it is two S2. Got it, thanks. Um, Gio, where are you? So anyway, so with that in mind, let's look at one that's a little more complex. Yes? No, no, that would, that, would, uh, that would defeat the purpose. I mean, unless it gave you an element and told you to predict the next spike, but I've never seen them ask that, but I suppose that that would be in the scope. Um, so you'll notice that we've got nitrogen here. All right, which we know has seven. So you can right away verify that this is representing seven total electrons. But I want you to look at spike two and spike three. Do you see how they're close together? That is a general indication that they share an energy. So that first spike is energy level one, one S2. And then the second spike is energy level two, two S2. But the third spike is also energy level two, which is two P3. So since the energy levels are close to each other, they're both twos, the spikes are close to each other. So that is another common trait of PES, yes. Okay, wait, so you said it was SSP, right? In this case, it is, yeah. So why aren't the S's close together? Because they're grouped together according to energy, not according to similar shape. Okay, cool. So the two that are close have both have energy too, all right? Well, what about the funkiest thing that you can see on one of these? So look at scandium. Now, right away, if we were to glance at scandium on the periodic table, you'll see that there should be 21 electrons. There are, but there's something really interesting that happens in scandium based on what should happen to represent the location of the electrons. See if you can find 3D1. Look at it the way that I looked at it, start because we know right here we're 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. It's filling it up. Where is 3d1? Isaac. What number is above it? Oh, I, I'm going to go with 3.24 or 0.77. 
Alright, well it can't be 3.24 because how many electrons are at 3.24? There's six. There are six. So, it's be seven. so why then, why do you think that 3D1 comes before 4S2 on the graph? Because of energy. Look, it's increasing in energy. So we know that energy level three right here has less energy than 4S2. Even though when you write the configuration, you would write 4S2, 3D1. But when we graph it, or when we use a machine that's just looking at energy, it's going to have the four as the last. Not only that, we know that an energy of four is further away from the nucleus than anything that has an energy of three. So it makes sense that the 3D is registering before the 4S, even though that's not necessarily how you've been taught to write it. Yes? So that's why I use the general. The question was, well, then why are the three and the four grouped by each other if you said they're grouped according to energy? And again, it has to do with it's, this is a very high energy level three compared to a very low energy four, but you will never be asked a question from that angle the way that you just asked it. 3.24 is, no, no, 3D1 is 0.77. Okay. Well, because look, 3D1 is the only one that actually only has one electron. So you're able to pinpoint it. My point is, is that if you were to write the configuration, you would write it last. But this has it second to last because 4S2 is going to register as more energy. Can I? Questions on PES? All right, so let's move into actual trends then. All right. So uh, back into some stuff that should be familiar. Before we do atomic radius and electronegativity, ionization energy, and all that stuff I've taught most of you before, I want to give you some, some hot words, I call them. Words that you want to be able to use on FRQs to really show the AP graders that you're a brilliant person with an amazing teacher. Uh, uh -oh. The three phrases are Coulomb's law, shielding, and, nu and effective nuclear charge. Now I'm going to do the next two in a moment. We'll start with Coulomb's law, but these are three ways to prove the trends. Last year, you were just asked to know the trends. All right, where to, which, direct, which element's bigger than what element, all right? But now you need to be able to explain, well, why? Why is that element larger? And it's those three words that explain it. Coulomb's law is this equation. Now, you will never ever be asked to write the equation. You'll never be asked to decipher the equation. You'll never be asked to calculate with it, all right? But I can use the equation to show you why Coulomb states that the trends behave the way they do. The F here is the general attraction, all right? So looking at the attraction of, uh, that, that exists within an atom. The two Qs, that, that's a constant value, who cares? The two Qs refer to the overall charge of the nucleus, the protons, and the overall charge of the electrons, all right? You know they're attracted to each other because one's positive and one's negative. Sorry, I didn't mean to leave this off. Um, one's positive and one's negative. Um, but what this is saying is that if, Q, if those two Qs have a greater charge, then they're even more attracted to each other. So they're both at the top of the equation. The greater the attraction is, uh, or the greater the charge is, the more they're going to be attracted to each other. We're talking about the protons in the nucleus to the electrons that are hanging out on the outside. But the R, the number that you would divide the value by, you won't have to, is the radius, the actual distance. Coulomb states that if the electrons, or rather the further the electrons get from the nucleus, the less the attraction is. That makes sense. You've played with magnets, right? If you have those magnets real close, they're super, uh, they're super sticky, all right, attractive. But the more you pull them apart, they start to even, they, they eventually don't even know that there's another magnet in the room, right? So Coulomb states that the larger the charges of the protons and the electrons, well, the more they'll be attracted. But the further they are away from each other, the larger the radius, the less attraction there will be. And you'll see as I go through the trends, I can pull back to this idea and say, and Coulomb's law supports this idea. Coulomb's name is an anagram for Columbus. So let's start. Exactly. Isn't that interesting? There's a 
atomic radius increases as you go down and left. The arrows I'm drawing are pointing towards the increasing direction on the periodic table. But why? All right, that's fine. We could say Frosium is the biggest element. Why? Why is he so large? All right. The reason this exists is because of what's called shielding. All right. Let's say, for example, that I was a proton and Jacob was an electron. All right. And we have, I'm positive, he's negative, so we have a natural attraction now. Yeah, exactly. I knew that you were going to catch it. Oh, God. That's so good. Continue. All right. So. Yes. So we have this plutonic relationship. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now, so we have this attraction. Shielding takes yeah. place when there's items that are blocking them, that are separating them. Like if I take this okay. and I put it between yeah. us, it's going to interfere with our attraction. It'll make us slightly less attractive. And then if I take this and I put it between us, now there's another item between us, even more or less attractive. All right. right there. And then I take this and I yell, sorry. Another item in between us, we become less attractive. Shh, shh. The way it works on the table is as you go down a group, there's more levels being added. There's more levels being added. And as that's happening, this nucleus, which is positive and attracted to the electrons, well, he's less attracted to that electron out there because all these other stupid electrons are shielding the charge. So what happens when this uh, nucleus can't pull in that electron anymore? Well, that electron starts to kind of spread out. So what happens to the size of the atom? It gets lo it's, it's, lo it's taking up more space. So as we go down the groups towards Francium, Francium has a ton of shielding. He's got a ton of levels blocking his attraction to his outermost electrons, and it makes them spread out more. It makes Francium take up more space. So what about the left? That's my next one, man. So Got you. It is, it is. Because every time you add an energy level, it adds another level of shielding. Yes. Because every time you add an energy level, this is what's happening. Right? Now, Coulomb's law also supports this idea. He doesn't use the word shielding. He just uses the phrase radius. He just says, if the distance between the valence electron and the nucleus increases, the attraction decreases. I'm telling you, if there's less attraction, then it's gonna be a larger molecule. Because the only way it would be a smaller molecule is if the protons were able to pull in those electrons. But he, he's too far. The radius is too big. Coulomb says a far radius is gonna end up being a big atom. Who was the first person to like Dylan asked, what about left to write. Not every time, only when I understand the exact basis of the question you're asking. <laughs> Alright. So why do they get smaller this direction? Right? That's what my trend says. They're getting smaller that direction. Alright. Well, think about this. Think about this. As you go across a period, you're not adding more levels. Right? You're not adding like if, if we start right here and we're going across a period, we're not adding more energy levels. We're staying, we're just going straight across in what we already have. So we're not adding more shielding. Shielding doesn't change left to right. The only thing that happens left to right is an increase in protons. Look, left to right, isn't that true? As you go across a period, we're throwing more protons into the bag. What do you think that nucleus can do if you start loading his bag full of protons? He can, he can pull, pull harder. He can pull. Oh my God! I got it. He can pull everything. He in. can pull harder on those electrons. So as we go across this direction, the proton, the nucleus, is getting stronger. We call that effective <laughs> nuclear charge. Effective nuclear charge increases as we go left. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was your left. As we go right <laughs> across the table. All right, which gives them the ability to pull harder on the electrons. And if you're pulling harder, your atom is getting smaller because the electrons are being pulled tight. I'm sorry? The, it increases as the protons are being added. So here's what you want to do as you move forward with this idea, all right? Coulomb's law can apply to everything based on the way the equation is set up. 
shielding is going to increase as we go down, while the effective nuclear charge is going to increase as you go to the side, because that's where protons are being added. Why does shielding increase down? Because you're adding energy levels. Why does effective nuclear charge increase this way? Because you're adding protons. So it's effective nuclear charge, shielding, and then Coulomb's law. Those are our hot word, our big AP words of the day. All right, so is that a question? No, it's good. All right. Now, ionic radius makes us think a little harder. It turns out that everything we've talked about so far is based off neutral atoms on the table. Well, what about when they have charges? This is a bit harder because the trend becomes a little fuzzy. Now, the basic thing that we have to understand is what makes an ion an ion. So if you have a cation, you're positive. What did that atom do to become positive? It lost electrons. It lost something, all right? It lost something. So if you're sitting there and you're wearing like a bunch of coats and you take a coat off, have you become Larger or smaller? Smaller. Smaller. So that's the reason that in general, shh, shh, cations are smaller than they are when they were neutral because they had to get rid of something to become cationic. So then on the flip side, anions would be larger because be, to become negative, you had to gain a particle. Now you've got more than you had before, so you should take up more space. Now, while I hope that idea is simple, <coughs> I can muddy the waters even a bit further. Oh, no. Thank you. Uh, it's strange. You want to make swamp water. Just make American water. So here's the deal. If I give you two ions from the same family, like I compare the ions of two alkaline earth metals, beryllium and strontium, this trend is good. It works. You don't have to think hard. But if I give you two different families, you have to think in terms of isoelectronic. Two elements that are isoelectronic have the same number of electrons when they become ions. Wait, what did I just say? They have the same number of electrons when they become ions. So it's like they have minus one plus one. So it's going to be like lithium and lithide, or right? That's what it's called? No, you don't do that to cations. But anyways, <laughs> um, here, here's what I want you to find. I want you to. I want you to look at calcium, and I want you to look at sulfur. That's what I was saying. Find it on the table. That's what I was saying before. Do we need to figure out the reading? Yes. We're going to go with 3D6. Yes. Now, it turns out shh, shh, that for calcium and sulfur to become these ions, what element do they become? Which element on the table do they become kind of identical to? Argon. Argon. They both become argon, basically, in regard to their electron count. I want everyone to verify that that makes sense. Minus two plus two plus two. All right? Sulfur is moving up two squares to argon. Calcium is dropping down two squares to argon. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. I'll say it again. For them to become ions. Calcium has to lose two electrons, which makes him move down two squares, which is where argon lives. Sulfur has to gain two electrons, which would make him move up two squares to also where argon lives. When you're asked to compare the sizes of two ions from different families like this, you have to think in terms of proton count when they are isoelectronic. Because remember, it's the protons that have the ability to pull in the electrons. We're now in a situation where we have the same number of electrons. The only difference between these two ions is the proton count right now. They both have electrons like, ion, like argon, but they have protons like their regular element. Therefore, who's smaller? Silver. No, calcium, calcium is smaller is because it's having minus two. It's calcium yeah. is yeah. smaller here. They have the same number of electrons, but who can pull harder? <laughs> Sulfur. Cal calcium, oh. because he's got more protons. Wait. So calcium is going to be pulling harder than sulfur, and that makes you smaller if you've got that 
nuclear charge. The reason I'm making a big deal about this is because if you apply this trend to calcium and sulfur, you might get it wrong. Yes? Uh, so the smaller it is, the more protons you have? <laughs> no, 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 don't, draw, don't go try to draw other absolutes because there's things that break it. I'm just saying that if they're isoelectronic, you want to look at the figure, I mean, you find out they're isoelectronic by seeing that they would equal the same noble gas when they become an ion. And then whichever one of those two, if we're in this situation, has more protons, will be smaller. Wait, why is it smaller again? I know you explained that. Like eight times. Oh my god. It's smaller because they would pull faster, pull more. I'm telling you that if you follow this trend, you would probably guess that sulfur is smaller. But since they're isoelectronic, they have the same number of electrons, just like argon, when he get lost two and he gained two. But now calcium has more protons in his nucleus. That may have, gives him the ability to pull harder than sulfur can. Do you agree that calcium has more protons than sulfur? Yes. Okay. So the moment you've got more positives, you can pull harder. That makes you smaller if you're pulling in the outside of your atom. So you can think of the protons as arms, and the ar like more arms you have, the more arms like more you're able to pull in. Stronger than just stronger. The protons have a stronger charge, making the atoms smaller. Because it's got. Because remember, pro positives and negatives are attracted to each other. So if I fill this fill this room with a million positives, I can pull in a lot more electrons than if I only have one positive. So he's got more positives. He's going to pull his atoms in. That's going to make him tighter and smaller. You've got 60 seconds before I draw cards. We're. We're not going to do the very bottom one. We're skipping the bottom one. It's a, it was a misprint. to the camera, it was cool. So, hi, bye, hi, bye. So you're supposed to be working. Oh, come on. I know it's an amazing book, but chemistry. You made a, a word that is a group of animals, correct? But you made it wrong. Um, how do you say that? Here we go. Let's go to cluster two, seat five. Two five. Uh, can you just give me the list for the number one here? C A K R B. Do y'all agree? I agree. All right. Um, let's head over to cluster one, seat four. One four. Give me your answer for number two. <laughs> Oh, cool. So they're ions. Now, hey, based on their location on the table, we can use the definition on knowing that cations become smaller and anions become larger. So based on that, who would be the smallest? Remember, getting rid of particles makes you small. So I'm going to say magnesium. Look, magnesium has lost the most particles. Do you agree? To become positive, you must get rid of electrons. Magnesium has lost two electrons, so he's lost the most stuff. So then what would be next? There you go. And then? All right. And then chlorine. Yep. Am I supposed to eat it? We good? Right, he's lost the most and he's gained the most, so he'd be the biggest 
based on their location on the table, though. Let's go over to cluster two, seat five. Isn't that fun, Reagan? What does that mean again? It totally. Hey, uh, number three. But this uh, uh, is iron larger when it's neutral or an ion. Well, when it's neutral is just when it's on the table, and then when it's an ion is when it's gained or lost particles. Neutral is correct because we know that iron wants to gain. I'm sorry, iron wants to become positive, so he wants to lose. So if he becomes an ion, he loses electrons. That makes him smaller. So therefore, he's larger when he's neutral. So let's go to a different trend. Electronegativity is going to increase right and up. There's a typo on it. Kathleen, stop. Anybody else being bad? Uh, I've been paying attention. I'll do it with them. You know I'm paying attention. Like, I'm All right. Shh, shh. Hey, electronegativity is kind of like tug of war within a molecule. All right. It's where we've got the different the electrons that are being shared in a molecule, and they're both trying to pull on them. Whichever of the atoms is more electronegative is the one that will be winning the tug of war. All right. Pulling the electrons closer to him. Electronegativity increases right and up. What is the most electronegative element on the table? Fluorine. Fluorine. So I'm glad that kind of rolled off some of your tongues. All right? Because fluorine is as far right and up as you can go without hitting a noble gas, who's not going to have any electronegativity because they don't want you to touch their electrons. So let's think about fluorine, though. Electronegativity means that you have the ability to attract electrons to you. Why would fluorine be the most electronegative? Well, let's talk about it in terms first of shielding. Does fluorine have a lot of shielding or a little bit of shielding? A little bit. Only a little bit, because remember, shielding increases as you start adding energy levels down groups. Fluorine doesn't have that problem. Fluorine's nucleus is hanging out super close to his electrons. There's very little shielding. He can pull really hard. But not only that, what is true about the effective nuclear charge of fluorine? He's got a lot of protons. Not only is there almost no shielding, He's got as many protons as he can have without being a noble gas. So this nucleus right here is loaded full of protons. And he's like, man, I've got no shielding. I've got all the protons in the world. He can pull harder than anybody can because shielding is low, effective nuclear charge is high. Therefore, his electronegativity is the highest of all the elements. He can pull up. Oh, he probably pulls away all right, and, that, and that's pretty much electronegativity. I don't have a lot to add to that. We're going to be doing a lot of electronegativity and bonding because it's going to dictate polar, nonpolar, and stuff. So, uh, so let's then move to our last trend. Ionization energy. We have a lot to talk about about ionization energy, though. Not like real country right there. Ionization energy increases right and up. It's the same direction trend as electronegativity. Thank you. So ionization energy refers to how much energy it takes to remove an electron. All right. If the ionization energy is really high, that means it's super hard to remove an electron. If it's really low, that means it's easy to remove an electron. Let's go to the other side of the table. Let's go to francium, all right? So I'm going the opposite trend. So if we go and we take a look at francium, you would say, well, in pre-AP, you would tell me he's got a very low ionization energy. Well, that's true, all right, because he's uh, left and down, so he would have a very low ionization energy. Now I want to know 
Why? Why is it so easy to steal from him? All right, well, what is true about Francium shielding? It's ridiculously high. Oh my goodness, look at all these levels that Francium has. All right, his nucleus is hanging out right here, and he's got all these levels shielding, blocking him from these valence electrons on the outside. This would be like if you at home you stored your most, what, 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 what's your biggest valuable? What's your favorite thing? Oh, I know. My, you know what mine is. Laptop. Your laptop. Here's where you decided to store your laptop. My stuff, my In the alley. You didn't store it, you didn't store it downstairs. You didn't store it in the backyard. You stored it all the way in the alley behind outside, so far away. What's gonna happen to your laptop? It's gonna get stuck. It's Like Batman. It's super easy. Francium. <laughs> Francium is an idiot, though. Francium doesn't have no He game. had to go to court. No game. Um, <laughs> he has to have all those shields. He had to do that thing where you point to the doll to say where it. <laughs> I just kept going. <laughs> it's dramatic. No, it's not that good. Uh, um, <laughs> no, no, what he said. That was terrible. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what about the doll? Wait, there's a doll being uh, ran? No. Oh, no. Isaac. Demonetized. <laughs> anyway, so the ionization energy is super low because this electron is easy to take. All right? This, he's so shielded, he's not attracted to the nucleus uh, barely at all, so it's easy to grab. And then, of course, this trend works the opposite direction towards fluorine. Very difficult to take fluorines because there's no shielding there with so many protons. Oh my god, that hurt so much. That just dislocated my neck. But why, if he has so many shields, why is it so easy to take stuff from him? Like, he should be protected. No, 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 because you're not taking stuff from down here. You're taking stuff from the alley. But like, can't they just like, break that shield? It's like, so it's like a real line. Like you're not trying to get into these inner shields. When we talk about ionization energy, it's taking valence electrons, which only looks at electrons that are on the outermost shell. It's a, it, basically every energy level is the simplest way to look at it. You won't be asked to look at it in any more dynamic way. All right, so here's an ionization energy question that you will definitely run into on the AP exam. They always ask a version of it, so listen. Yeah. This gives you, instead of just asking about the general trend, this gives you values. It's like, hey, I don't want to know if it's easier to take from him and him. I want to look at how many kilojoules it takes to actually steal the electron. I want you to look at the three values it gives. I want you to quietly compare them together. Okay. All right? Draw a conclusion in your brain about where there's an anomaly. In your brain, I knew you couldn't handle it. Multiply by two is squared. What do you put, what, where is the most interesting change between levels? Uh, two to three. Why? Yeah, two to three. Look at that. The one to two is a change. It's about twice as much. But what's the change from ionization two to ionization three? A ton. It goes from basically 1,800 to 15,000. Now, here's what this is. The energy level, the IE1, is the amount of energy it takes to remove the first electron. The ionization energy two is the amount of energy it takes to remove the second electron. And the ionization energy three, the third electron. What do you think this tells you about beryllium? Since it takes a ridiculous amount of energy to remove the third electron compared to the first two. The protons, because they're pulling so hard. What? What's that? There's less shields. Now, I'm glad that y'all's brains are so wrapped around those words right now. Like, cool, cool. Columbus. Captain America. There's only two valence electrons. Those first two electrons were kind of easy to steal because they were on the outside. What's that third electron? Look, it's beryllium. What is the third electron in beryllium? It's an inner shell electron. Beryllium only has two valence. So once you take the two valence, if you try to take a third one, that is a core electron. It's almost impossible to do it because we never talk about stealing oh. inner shell electrons, right? So, Whoa. Yes. So, 
One, two, three. Those are the robberies of the electrons? Those are the order that it's taking electrons, starting with the valence and working its way in. He does. He does. So there would be an ionization energy four also, and it would be even higher than ionization energy three because three and four are core electrons, inner shell, that beryllium doesn't give away. Are the kilojoules like uh, the amount of power it is to do? The amount of energy it takes. It is the ionization energy. So it's the amount of energy it takes to remove the electron. So here's what questions could do. Instead of it saying, this is beryllium, and then you saying, oh yeah, beryllium has two valence, the numbers make sense. What it could do is just give you a list of ionization energies for an unknown atom and say, what element might this be? And really what your job is, is to compare the data and see where the spike is. Because wherever there's a spike will help you indicate how many of the electrons are valence. And then you can pinpoint what element is what element. Because it will always be a huge spike once you get to the first core electron. <laughs> Continuing with some AP heavy stuff, there are two exceptions to this trend. And this will mess you up. You will miss this question on AP if you miss these exceptions because they'll always ask about one of them. So let's look. The first exception takes a look at beryllium compared to boron, which is basically comparing group 3 to group 13. All right? It's just using these two elements as an example. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. My bad. Two. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to draw the orbital notations for both of them so I can show you why these will be trend breakers. So beryllium goes 1s2, 2s2, while boron goes 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. Under the normal trend, who would you tell me, before I show you this, has the lower ionization energy? This, come on, this is, oh, oh, this is killing me that you're doing this. The lower. Who's got the lower ionization energy based on the trend? Beryllium, right? Ionization energy increases right and up. So beryllium is further left, so it looks like he would have a lower ionization energy. However, here's why the trend breaks when you compare elements in group two to elements in group 13. You see that one electron right there? Yeah. He is existing in this different shaped cloud. And even though we don't look at the orientations anymore of those sublevels, it turns out that this electron is curving further away from the nucleus than that electron right there is. In other words, this P shape is bringing the electron slightly further away from the nucleus, which automatically makes it easier to remove. This has less ionization energy, these elements do, than those. Does the same apply for manganese and not manganese, it's group two, not group three. Uh, group two, column two, compared to column 13. It's for the elements that live in those columns, compared to each other in the same row. Okay. That's one of the exceptions. Does that make sense? It's based off cloud shape. Yes. No, it's all of the elements that live in group 2 and in group 13, but in the same period. Okay, uh, magnesium and aluminum. Another exception to ionization energy. No. 
And our last slide, thank goodness, right? Yes. Let's compare nitrogen to oxygen. <coughs> In other words, what we're really comparing, these are the examples. What I'm really comparing are groups 15 and 16. All right? Let's take a look at their orbital notation together. All right? Nitrogen goes 1s2. 2s2, 2p3. Oxygen's got one more, so 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. Kind of frightened to ask this question. Under the normal trend rules, who would you expect to have a smaller ionization energy? Nitrogen. You would expect nitrogen because he's further left. Don't let them trick you because it's not true here either. When comparing elements in group 15 to group 16 in the same period, if we look at this electron, which would be the one that, be, would, that would be removed in nitrogen, and compare it to this electron, the one that would be removed in oxygen. What's different about these two electrons compared to each other? One is the Right. So what would be true about this association here? They're both electrons. What's true about two electrons? They, they hate each other. They hate each other. They're both negative. Here's what we have. In this orbital, we just have one electron hanging out in a very stable form. But in this orbital, we have two electrons desperately trying to get as far away from each other as they can. Therefore, since this electron's already trying to escape, he's easier to remove. Less ionization energy. Oxygen has less than nitrogen. Now, the trend is true everywhere else. The only exceptions are these two specific groups that I've listed here in your presentation. Sorry? The, yes, 15 and 16 compared to each other in the same period. 